Chapter 21. Enlisting Help. Oh my god, I whisper, sinking onto the bed, feeling nauseous. I'm suddenly unsure my legs can support me and reread the note to make sure I didn't imagine the words. Are you even listening to me, Michael? Liv says, sounding uptight. Trying to catch my breath, I stare into the corner of the room with glazed eyes and feel the letter slip from my limp fingers floating down to settle on the reddish greeny patterned carpet. Eve's in trouble, and I didn't know. Somebody has her right now, and they are doing sick things to her. I think I'm going to throw up. Are you okay? Ryan says, sounding worried, as he reaches down to pick up the letter. What's... His voice trails off and his face drops as he reads it. What time is it? I ask, my voice barely audible. Dear God, no, Ryan gasps, sounding shocked and horrified. Ten to four in the afternoon, Liv says, responding to my question with a puzzled look on her face. Here, check this out, Ryan says, handing her the letter. Thinking fast, I realise I have to do something. Scanning the room, I locate my phone in a corner by the window and reassemble it before turning it on. Ignoring all the messages and missed calls, I dial Eve's number. Holy mother, Liv exclaims, this has to be a sick joke. Eve's phone is turned off and goes straight to voicemail. Sighing, I flip my phone shut and slip it into my pocket. Fastening up my jeans and belt, I get out a clean t-shirt and slip it on. Are there reporters outside? I question, slipping my trainers on and lacing them up. They confirm there are. Grabbing my room key and my wallet, I tear out of there and down the corridor without another word. Where are you going? Liv calls after me. In the lobby, I look around, trying to work out if any of the people lurking here are the press. Then I step outside into the street and look around. I thought they said there were media folks down here. Going back into the lobby, I look around again and meet the watchful eyes of a security guard. I wonder how long he's been standing there. I guess he's better than nobody. Approaching him cautiously, I consider how best to question him. Excuse me, I say, holding up the envelope. Did you happen to notice anybody going upstairs with this? He frowns at the envelope and then at my face. No, I can't say I did, he says. Sorry. Okay, thanks. I smile faintly at him and turn away. I notice someone nearby staring intently at me, his eyes bright with intrigue. The man was leaning against the end of the reception desk and by all accounts being ignored by the receptionist, but now approaches me. Mr Miller? He questions cautiously. Michael Miller? I look him over, trying to work out who he is. He's wearing a t-shirt and jeans paired with trainers and a suit jacket and is holding a mobile phone clutched in one fist. Maybe, I reply with equal caution. Possibly having overheard him, at least two more men step forward and flashbulbs pop in my face. Trying to blink away the white lights floating across my vision, I wonder how I missed them before. I never thought I'd be grateful that perhaps trail me everywhere like a bad smell. Questions are thrown at me, but all I can decipher is my name. I need to know something important, I say, still partially blinded, and hold up the envelope. Did any of you see somebody come in with this? There is a long moment of silence, and I think I can see them exchanging looks with each other. Why is that so important? The one I saw looking at me from the end of the reception desk says. I guess he's a reporter. Trying not to think of what Eve might be going through, I sigh. Reporters always have to be so curious, asking more questions than they are willing to answer. I really can't tell you guys, I say apologetically. I just need to know who left this for me, please. Yeah, I saw him. The guy with the big ass camera hanging round his neck says, chewing gum. I only noticed him because he looked so out of place in here. His t-shirt had crazy wild bright patterns on it and I'm sure he had blood spattered across the front. Also, his trainers were weird. Grabbing the man's t-shirt in my hands with excitement, I stare at him with slightly wild eyes. Please tell me you snapped a picture of them. He looks taken aback by my reaction and backs away from me, looking at me sideways as if I'm a crazy person. Maybe, 
he says, speaking slowly, and studies me for a moment. What did the letter say? Can I see the photo? I say. He looks at me for a further beat before looking down at his camera. It wasn't a love letter, was it? He says, fiddling with his camera. Was it from your stalker? The reporter questions, still looking at me with intense curiosity. I look up, up at him sharply, wondering how he heard about my stalker. I don't know, I admit, responding with open honesty. I don't know who it's from. Know him? The photographer says. I turn my attention back to his camera and look at the image on the display on the back. It is a view of the man from behind and the guy as, as he described. There is a white envelope sticking out of one of his back pockets, and even though you can't make out what it says from the photo, you can tell the writing on the envelope is made up of cutouts from magazines. No, I frown, shaking my head. Mike, Liv calls from somewhere behind me. Listen, can you get me a print of that photo? I say, ignoring her and looking at him. Well, it's also really important that you don't delete it. What the hell are you doing? Liv whispers in my ear. Sure, the pap agrees with a shrug. What's in it for me? Liv jabs her elbow into my ribs. What? I snap irritably and turn to her with a scowl on my face. Why are you talking to them? She whispers, flashing the press of bright fate smile. They're helping, I reply, not bothering to lower my voice and turn back to the pap. I'm sure we can come to an arrangement. Give me your name and number and I will get back to you. Is that okay? Sure, the pap says again and turns to the reporter. Can I borrow your pen and paper, El? If elbows me again, regaining my attention and gives me a meaningful stare. She is really starting to wind me up. If she does that one more time, I'm going to feel like smacking her. I don't know what's wrong with her. She always seems to be uptight, even when there's nothing to be upset about. Maybe her job is too stressful. I wonder if she's ever considered a different career path. If you're not going to be helpful, just take a walk, Liv, I grumble, scowling at her again. My reputation is already in ruins, so I don't know what you're getting so wound up for. The only thing that matters is finding Eve. I notice that she is still holding the letter and take it from her, folding it up and inserting it back into the envelope. Just call the police, Mike, she says. Aware that the reporter is two feet away and probably has ears like a bat, I consider my response carefully. How can I shut her up without giving anything away? Or is it already too late? You know I can't, I say. So what's going on, Michael? The reporter says, holding out a slip of paper to me. You can be straight with us. I take the slip from him and put it in my pocket, considering what to say. The letter says not to tell the media, but why? The police I get, but why the press too? Thanks for your help, I say, deciding to play it safe, but I'm afraid I can't tell you anything yet. As I start to walk away, the reporter catches my arm. Wait, please, Michael, we can help you. I look at him. His eyes are sparkling with excitement, like he has figured out what's wrong and knows it's one hell of a story. He also has a concerned frown on his face, contradicting the elation in his eyes. I wonder if he means what he said, or the offer is simply an excuse to help himself get an exclusive. Really? How? I say. He drops his hand from my arm. Eve's been kidnapped and held to ransom, hasn't she? He says, lowering his voice. I'm an idiot. He's figured it out. I must have given the game away. What if that mistake kills her? I mean, who knows what this maniac is capable of? Please, buddy, you can't tell anyone, I plead, whispering. Her life could be in danger. I'm under strict instructions not to tell the media about this. Elliot Richards, he says, offering me his hand. I work for the sun. I shake his hand. Wherever you're going, I'll give you a lift, he says. I want to help. I regard him in silence for a moment. Okay, I'd sure appreciate that, I nod. Miller, Liv cries, following us into the street. Where are you going? What is your problem? I snap. When she starts to speak again, I'll hold up my hand to stop her. Save it, I say, turning back to Elle. Where's your car? Liv lets out an exasperated sigh and storms off. Down the street this way, Elle says. Hey, Ryan gusps, running to catch up with us. I want to help. I didn't really have a plan when we left the hotel. 
who might not even be held in this country. And I don't know what section of the newspaper Elle reports for, but I have watched him talk with a couple of dodgy-looking contacts. Unfortunately, to no avail. Ryan has directed him to Pinewood for some reason. What are we doing here? I sigh as Elle pulls into a space in the car park. We don't have any hope of finding Eve until she turns up somewhere later. You know, she might not even be here in the UK, Ryan says. Rollins, on the other hand, thinks he's died or something. Getting out of the car, I tilt my head skywards and sigh deeply. I'd rather not be here right now, but here we are anyway. As I follow Ryan onto the set, Elle walks at my side, looking around curiously. There is hardly anyone around. Hey, Ryan catches the attention of a passing stagehand. Have you seen Rollins about? He looks round at the three of us. I have, about five minutes ago. Let me just see if I can track him down for you. With that, he turns and hurries away. Thanks, Ryan calls after him. You want some coffee, Mike? You look like hell. Sure, I nod, smiling faintly at him. That'd be great. I'll go get some. Elle, you want some? He says, ready to leave. Yeah, thanks, Ryan. Elliot smiles, if it's no trouble. Back in a minute, Ryan says. I miss Chrissy. I need her friendly face right now and her reassuring arms. So why does this Rollins think you've died? Elle questions, casting his eyes across a nearby table laid out with props. I haven't been a regular fixture down here this week. I think they've missed me, I say, wandering into the nearby wardrobe department office. What am I going to do now? I look around at the rails of costumes and desks cluttered with... I look around at the rails of costumes and desks cluttered full of accessories. Someone has kidnapped Eve. What would anyone want with her? I mean, okay, maybe I get that, but it's a very extreme step to take. I hope she's okay. I wish I knew where she was. Hi, Michael. The girl I hadn't initially noticed greets me. It's good to see you. We were getting worried. I give her what is probably a vacant smile and watch her as she continues flicking through the rail of costumes, checking on her clipboard and scribbling notes. I want to grab Eva out of whatever nightmare she is in the middle of. Thank God, Miller, Graham sighs from the doorway behind me. I thought you dropped off the face of the earth. I turn to face him and see that he is looking at Elle, who is admiring the accessories curiously. I've got problems, Graham, I say. So what else is new, he says, looking over at the girl. Sheila, could you give us a minute, please? Sure, Mr. Wallins, she says cheerfully enough, and sets down the clipboard on a desk, leaving the room. Thanks, he says. And who are you? Elle looks at him, and I can see him try to figure out the best way to answer. He's with me, don't worry about him, I jump in, figuring it's no problem for him to be here for this conversation. Okay, fine. Graham closes the door behind Sheila. What's up now, and where have you been for the last three days? I get the letter out of my pocket and hold it out to him. I got this under my door this morning. He takes it and reads through it. I have no idea who has Eve. I feel so helpless. Everything that I've been through this last week will be nothing compared to the trauma she is enduring right now. He's beaten her, probably raped her numerous times, and ensures she'll lose our baby, apparently. Is this for real? he gasped, looking shocked. I notice Elle listening. He is still looking at the accessories table, but in a way that you can tell he is actually paying more attention to what is being said, rather than what's in front of him. I remember that he has not seen the letter yet. I hate to think what that son of a bitch is doing to her right now. I growl, running a hand through my hair, beginning to pace up and down. Don't go down that road, Graham says. You can't think like that. I pause my pacing long enough to take the letter from him and slip it back into the envelope and my pocket. But why is he telling me this now for, I wonder? There's no ransom demand or anything like that. It's just gloating. I've got your girlfriend. What are you going to do about it? Balling my hands into fists, I lock one hand inside the palm of my other in front of my chest. Maybe that's the point, Graham says. He wants you hurting like she is. Ryan comes into the room and hands me on L coffees. Thanks, Ryan, I say, accepting it. Well, it's working. I told you he was okay. 
Ryan says, leaning against the back of the door. Mm hmm. Graham says, So what are you going to do, Mike? That's a good question. I haven't really thought that far ahead yet, but I know what I want to do to the guy holding her hostage. I'm going to find out who this asshole is, I growl, trying not to squeeze the hot polystyrene coffee cup in my hands. Then I'm going to introduce his face to a baseball bat. No, 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 Graham exclaims. Mike, that's a bad plan, Ryan agrees. You should just leave it to the professionals, Elle advises. Graham looks at him, as if maybe he forgot Elle was here. No way, I exclaim, my accent showing again as I continue to pace. This punk thinks he can abuse my girlfriend to get away with it. He's got another thing coming. Not only that, but he threatened my unborn child. I'm going to teach him a lesson, if it's the last thing I do. I crush the coffee cup in my hand, spilling hot liquid all over them, and surprisingly, it doesn't really hurt that much. You can't go anywhere in this state, Ryan says. You're not thinking straight. And I'm sorry, Mike, but we can't put this production on hold any longer, just because you have personal issues, Graham says. Personal issues? I spit fury rippling through my whole body. Picking up a book off one of the nearby desks, I launch it at the window that looks out onto the set with an enraged growl. I notice Elle starts at this sudden temper explosion as the book thumps against the window, rattling the blinds noisily. How the fuck would you feel if some lunatic kidnapped your wife? I holler at Graham. I think I have the right to be upset. I'm not saying you shouldn't be upset. Graham sighs, rubbing his face and looking tired. But I need you here Monday morning. I can't promise anything, I growl, stalking towards Ryan. Ryan swallows uncomfortably at my approach and steps aside, opening the door as he does so. Let's go, guys, I say, striding through the doorway. As we head back out to the car park, my phone rings. I forgot I'd left it on and pull it out, answering it this time. What? I snap angrily at the caller, without looking to see who it is. If this is a bad time, Justin responds hesitantly, I can ring back later. Sorry, man. I sigh, trying not to sound as angry as I feel. What's up? I stand by Elle's car without climbing in alongside them. I've been trying to get in touch with you for ages, Justin says. I've set up that meeting. Cool, I sigh, feeling a little better. Where? When? My place, he says. Do you know my place? Can you be there? In California? I gasp, remembering that he has a rented apartment in the vicinity of the Hollywood studios and how far away that is from here. Is that a problem, he says. I'm in London right now too. Don't worry if that's all it is. Figuring that Eve is probably kidnapped from her home and is being held somewhere out there, I realise he has just given me another reason to go back out there, as if I needed one. Sure, it's perfect, I laugh. When? Tomorrow, as soon as we can get there, he says, sounding relaxed again. OK, sure. See you soon, I say and hang up. You getting in or what, Miller? Elle questions, leaning across the inside of the car and calling out through the window he's opened on my side. Yeah, I say, pulling the door open. Sounds like you've got a lot of problems, huh? El remarks as he pulls out of the space. That's a bit of an understatement. I chuckle darkly. Listen, El, I know this story about Eve is a big deal, but I want you to promise me that you will sit on it. I was expecting him to protest this request, but he doesn't. Sure, he agrees, but on one condition. I'd like to see the letter. Really? I say, my surprise showing. He stops the car in the middle of the car park. I have a pregnant wife and a young daughter, he turns to me. If anything ever happened to them, I don't know what I'd do. If Eve's life and that of your unborn child are in danger, I don't want to do anything to jeopardise that. No matter how massive the story is, no exclusive is worth someone's life. I feel like hugging him and all crying at the same time, but settle for handing him the letter. Who knew journalists could be so human? Watching him as he reads it, the colour drains from his face and his mouth drops open. Elle lets out a low whistle and grimaces as he, as he hands it back. That's cold. Who'd want to do something like that to you two? I shrug uselessly at him, folding the letter up again. Wait, can I take a photo of that? He says. 
I pause in the middle of reinserting it into the envelope and look at him. I won't tell my boss anything about this, El says, holding up his hands. Nothing will appear in print until you tell me she's okay. I promise. Cross my heart, Mike. He offers further reassurance by making the gesture across his chest with his index finger. Okay, I say, unfolding the letter, but I'm going to hold you to that. He pulls out his phone and takes a couple of photos of the letter. Thanks, Mike, he smiles, putting his phone away again and driving off. Let me have your number, L, I say. If you keep your word, I will contact you. When I know, you'll know. OK, he says. I will owe you massively for this. He dictates his number to me and I note it down in my contact book on my phone. I have to go to California, I say, putting my phone away. I bet that's where Eve is. Can you drop me at the airport? Sure, that's no problem, L says. Where do you want to go, Ryan? The hotel, if that's okay, Al, he says. I don't mean to use you as a taxi. I live out near Heathrow, so it's perfect. I don't mind dropping you back at the hotel either, he says. The worst part is the London traffic. Oh, I know, Ryan sighs, chuckling in agreement. You never get used to it, I agree. I can't wait to get back out there. I only hope there is space on one of the flights departing tonight. In California, I get the cab driver to drop me a block away from Justin's place and walk the rest of the way there. After arriving here earlier, I checked into a local hotel and took a shower. I'd rather have searched for Eve, but I have to meet this guy and I'd like to make a good impression. Justin answers my knock on the door. It's good to know he's here. Are you alone? He says, looking anxiously over my shoulder at the quiet street. Were you followed? When did he get so paranoid? I walked the last block, bud. Can I meet him or what? Glancing around again and at me, he stands aside and lets me in. Come on through, he says. I shut the door behind me, but not satisfied with that, Justin locks it after me before leading me down to the basement. There is a single bright light hanging on the ceiling above the circular table in the middle of the smoke-filled room, where half a dozen guys are sitting around playing cards and hip-hop music play emanates from the boombox in the corner. I guess they've been here a while. James King stands out because he is the only one here with a real air of authority about him. He has a real presence, that and the fact I've seen his face in the press. Everyone looks up as Justin and I approach the table. This is Michael Miller, Justin introduces me. King is a big black man with neatly combed hair, no facial hair and a fat cigar hanging from his lips. The way he is dressed reminds me of the old school mafia guys, smart suits and those hats, except King isn't wearing a hat. James gets to his feet, looking at me from across the table for a moment before reaching across and shaking my hand. James King, he says, his voice deep and booming, heavy with an American accent. If I was a native, as in I'd lived here my whole life, maybe I'd be able to place it by state. Good to know you. Likewise, I nod, returning his firm handshake. Feel free to call me Mike. These are my homies, James says, remaining on his feet and indicating each man in turn. Greg, Fish, Steele, Myers and Whip. I nod my head at the guys as they all regard me. With the introductions finished, he returns to his chair and goes back to shuffling the pack of cards in front of him. I sit in the remaining empty seat at the table, noticing Justin is already seated. We've been hearing a lot about you recently, Mike, King says, not looking at me, and proceeds to deal a new handout to everyone around the table. Justin told us what you said, but I'd like to hear it from you. Forgive me for asking this, I begin watching him deal the cards out, but why does that matter so much to you? You've heard about my rep, he says, looking up from the cards for a moment. Believe me, Mikey, I like bitches as much as the next brother, and I may raise my hand when they need to be kept in line, but I ain't never given it to a honey that didn't want it. It's weird hearing him talk in this way. I'm not used to being around people who talk like this. It's all bullshit. What have you heard about me? 
I didn't rape that girl. I was just in the wrong place at the wrong time. And because the cops got nothing better to do, they're trying to nail me for it, I say. If I wasn't famous, I wouldn't even be in this situation. So what are we playing here anyway? King nods in either agreement or acceptance and continues to deal the cards. Poker, Justin says, handing me a beer. Thanks. I crack it open and take a sip before looking at my hand of cards. So what problem do you have, Mike? Fish says. Fish is also a black guy, but skinnier than King and tall with it. He's not dressed like he's going to a funeral, though, but in regular jeans and a t-shirt. He has a bit of a fuzzy afro going on with his hair and neatly trimmed fashion stubble around his mouth. Have you heard anything about what's been going on between me and a Thomas Slag, I say. Name rings a bell, Greg says thoughtfully. Greg is a white guy, with typical all-American white guy good looks. He has brown, slightly wavy hair, cropped close to his head, and no facial hair, making his chiselled jaw more obvious. He is also dressed in t-shirt and jeans. I think Justin mentioned him a couple of times, Fish says. Some arsehole accountant, right? Right, I say, taking another sip of beer. He's in a long-term relationship with my 18-year-old cousin, and has a habit of abusing her. I can't take it any more. I hate seeing what he does to her. That no good scum sucking rat beats her, rapes her, and terrorizes her into keeping quiet about it. That's some problem, Mikey. King sighs deeply, his exhale blowing a cloud of smoke across the table. You want him to catch the bus? Steele questions, shuffling change into the middle of the table. Steele is wearing a baseball cap backwards over his black hair and is wearing a football jersey with a large, thick silver chain hanging down the front and some kind of symbol as the pendant. No, 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 nothing like that, I exclaim, glad I get the references. As much as I'd like to see him gone, I don't want to be connected to a murder. Holding the cigar between his fingers, King lays his hand face down on the table and leans back in his chair, audibly sucking air through his teeth. Now that's a big word he says, regarding his cigar thoughtfully and watching it billow smoke. We're not talking anything that heavy, man. Who knows what kind of accident might happen to a fellow like him. King looks up at me, a slow smile forming on his face now. Maybe he has a nasty fall down the stairs or mixes alcohol with prescription medication or gets hit by a bus. Know what I mean? Accidents have a nasty habit of being fatal, Justin smiles. Yeah, he might fall off a bridge, I say, recalling my threat to him with a smile. Wearing concrete boots. Wait a minute, what am I saying? I only want to put him in hospital, I say, knocking back more beer. How many times has he put her there, Fish says. I lost count, I frown, so can you help me? Sure, sure, King nods, his cigar back in his mouth now and the cards back in his hands as he studies them. Sounds right up our street. Cool, I sigh, pushing some change into the middle of the table. Does it matter that he's a Brit? Yeah, yeah, King dismisses my concern. That's no problem. So what are we talking for that, I ask. Five Gs, US. King exhales, blowing more smoke across the table. That's not a problem for you, is it? Absolutely not, no problem. I try not to pull a face as I can taste the nicotine. Come on, Whip, you're the only one that ain't put money in yet. Greg says with a smile. Myers is sat next to me and is the only female in the room. She has long dark hair hanging loose and partially covering her olive face. She is chewing gum, her lips a deep shiny shade of red and her long nails painted to match. Her cards are held face down but not quite resting on the tabletop. She is dressed in black, her lacy top is cut very low over her bust with a tight fitting blouse over it but unfastened and with a small gold cross on a long thin chain at her bust. She also has bangles and bracelets on her wrists and a pair of hoops in her ears. She catches me staring and narrows her eyes suspiciously at me. You got something to say there, Miller? I shake my head, not shying away from her harsh brown eyes. You want to mess with me? Maya's questions, her back still up. Justin looks between me and her. He doesn't want any trouble, Myers. You know, Mikey, King says, she once cut up this guy just for pinching her butt. Okay, now I'm starting to get nervous and run my tongue across my lips. I was only looking. 
I exclaim, holding up my hands in a gesture of surrender. She's not a bitch. She's one of the guys, Steele says. Well, whatever she has done in the past, she has clearly earned their respect and a place at their side as an equal. I haven't known them long enough yet to know how hard-earned that respect is. She is still staring at me with a look that I would liken to a cat stalking its prey. OK, I got it, I say nervously. I didn't mean anything by it. At this moment, my phone decides to start ringing. Pulling it out, I don't recognise the number, but answer anyway, hoping I won't regret it. Yeah, I say, very aware that everyone at the table is watching me. You need to get to Bayside Hospital right now, Michael, the rather breathless-sounding man on the other end says. Who is this? I frown. Kevin Harper, he pants. I'm an investigative journalist with the LA Times. I'm not even going to waste my time trying to ask him how and where he got my number. What's at the hospital, I wonder? Your girlfriend, he says, and with that hangs up on me. This story is now available as an ebook, so please check out the link in the description. Um, I'd love it if you would um, buy it. And please note that you don't have to own a Kindle to read ebooks, because I don't know if everyone knows this. You, there is an app that's available. So, yeah, please check it out, it's so exciting. <laughs>